This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and another incredible week at Boca Chica with rapid development and stacking of the SN3 Starship. This beast is destined to take at least a short flight very soon, so exciting times here. We had SpaceX's Starlink 5 mission during the week as well, which also had some interesting surprises. Another lost booster, which is quite abnormal these days, so we'll talk a little more about that. Then we had Rocket Lab make some intriguing news of their own with an acquisition and a new certification announcement. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Over to Boca Chica in Texas to catch up on Starship development. Early in the week, SpaceX shipped the SN2 test tank back to the construction yard. We were thinking this is likely just to clear the space at the launch site in preparation for the next tests to be undertaken. At this point, we are unsure if the SN2 will ever be used for anything else at this point. It may simply be deconstructed now that it's served its purpose. Now, some interesting information from Elon this week. When asked about the plans for material that will be used Used on future versions of Starship, Elon responded saying that some of the parts will use 304L stainless steel as it has a higher toughness at cryogenic temperatures. In the longer term, SpaceX will move to internally developed alloys probably by the end of the year. Now, this is interesting in a number of ways. The 301 stainless steel, which we believe is in use for the majority of the current Starship builds, has lower chromium and nickel content than 304 steel. This actually makes the 304 steel typically a little more expensive. That depends largely on the costs for chromium and nickel at the time of course, but the 304L variant that Elon mentioned here in this tweet refers to an extra low carbon version of the 304 type. After talking to a few people it seems that this decision may help in a number of ways. The 304L appears to minimise some common issues with welding. Typical 304 steel tends to corrode easier in comparison to the L type. On the flip side it does seem quite a bit weaker at room temperature than the 301 steel, which is likely why Elon is saying here that some parts will use 304L. Now, I'm certainly no expert in this area. If you are, please do let us know your thoughts in the description about all this. It also looks like SpaceX are having some good success with the Raptor engines. Elon said this week that there are lots of Raptors coming through and operating on both horizontal and vertical firing stands. Of course, this engine, for those that don't know, is a full flow stage combustion engine fueled with liquid methane and liquid oxygen. Not only that, but this was also the first engine of this type to ever fly, first with the Starhopper flight last year, and we are hopefully going to see three more of these firing up together to do short flights with this SN3 Starship very soon. If you are interested in more information into why this engine is groundbreaking, I've got a link popping up here in the top right. I love the beautiful exhaust from the engine. The Starhopper 150 meter test flight really shows this beautifully. It's just so clean compared to the typical RP1 that we're used to seeing with the Falcon 9. Another interesting conversation here between Raphael and Elon Musk. After wanting a little clarification in the Starship length based on recent discussions, Elon responded saying that 20 meters is close and the design is evolving rapidly. It would be great to flatten domes, embed the engines and add around 1.5 barrel sections of propellant for the same total length. So yes, they're really here trying to make the whole structure more efficient. The curve in the bulkheads are quite pronounced, and I guess it's quite difficult to make useful space from around these sections. The curve, of course, produces great strength compared to a flatter design. However, something in between would likely offer some space savings while still providing adequate strength. Now, Raphael here put together some great graphics showing estimated volumes for the tanks and fairing. When we compare the usable space inside the main fairing area where the crew and cargo will live, there is significant reduction to space due to those high domes. Also interesting is the rough volume calculations here appear to come remarkably close to Raptor's expected 1 to 3.6 liquid methane to liquid oxygen ratio. Elon also complained a little about the legs here being too small, and based on what we saw with the Mark 1, I can certainly agree with all that. I've been assuming the legs would end up being quite a lot larger at some point because this here wasn't looking overly realistic. As always, we saw some great video from Boca Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight with the SN3 Starship components coming together this week. The footage of this bulkhead here shows it flipped upside down. This is actually the bottom of the liquid oxygen tank with the latest 
version of the thrust puck structure incorporated into it. Beautiful shots here as always. If you're not subscribed to the NASA Spaceflight channel, that is a great channel to follow. These video content segments are dropping there almost daily. A link to the channel there is in the description. So yes, the triple ring stack was fit over the bulkhead and work continued heavily on this whole segment of the SN3 for quite some time. This is one of the more intricate components of course as these are where all the engines are to be mounted. By midweek we were seeing a lot more stacking going on, this time with the nose cone. We've seen the top half of the nose sitting by without much action for a while but the entire component was lifted up on top of the newer lower nose cone section here. Over to the assembly building and there was loads going on here as well. Work continues on the building itself with wall segments being attached throughout the week. There hasn't been a huge focus on this since the main structure was completed, however it certainly looks like it's going to be finalised very soon. More excitingly though, we spotted this awesome little internal elevator during the week. This is certainly going to help the team move to segments of the Starship as it's being constructed quickly when compared to needing the constant movements of the bucket vehicles to get to common areas of the Starship. The development speed seemed to ramp up even faster at this point and wow some of the footage was just mind blowing. Just take a look at the thrust puck structure here from inside the tank. I don't believe we've seen anything with this clarity before around this area. We can see the main lines that will lead to the future set of three Raptor engines. The structure themselves were looking much cleaner when compared to all previous ships to date. Now as the week progressed we've seen a bunch of these tank components stacked. This current diagram also by Raphael shows us how all the sections around the shipyard here will come together. From the top down we have the nose cone shown earlier. Some other sections are still under construction that make the bottom of the nose cone to the tanks, but these shouldn't be too far away. Then comes the massive tank section itself we see in the assembly building here, making up both the liquid methane and liquid oxygen tanks. Then comes the engine bay with the thrust puck structure underneath with just a few final rings to go right at the bottom to accommodate the engines and landing legs. Thanks again again Raphael for sharing these amazing diagrams. I'm just so happy to see that we have this incredible work being filmed by amazing people out there such as Boca Chica Gal. It's a real privilege to even be able to see it all publicly here like we do. This is why SpaceX and more specifically Starship development is exciting for so many of us. We can see this design and engineering effort in real time. The fact that you all followed this channel to catch up on this stuff just blows my mind as well. I couldn't do what I'm doing without your support and with you amazing people out there following me we can all share in this interest together. Some positive news right now really is what we all need so thank you, thank you for all being engaged with all of this. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to suggest that some of this footage that we're seeing here will end up in history books. Thanks very much Mary, awesome work. The thrust puck structure here in some of these shots certainly seems a lot more solid and robust than the version that caused the SN1 Starship to explode. If you want to know more about that incident I've got a video here that goes deeper into all of that. While you're here of course please do consider subscribing, there's loads of news coming not only with Starship but Starlink and Crew Dragon, I'd love to share all that with you. Now Lab Padre who provides a bunch of live stream footage at Boca Chica was out making some mad progress with the new site being built up for camera equipment. This is a major upgrade so it's going to be awesome to check out some new video once the site here is set up and running. A lot of concrete foundation work going on here of course so interested in seeing this unfold. It should make for some super material. Obviously all of this setup has quite a large cost so if you utilize this service a lot please do support the channel there to help fund this stuff. Thanks Lewis for the dedication to the setup here mate. What you're doing is most appreciated by all the Starship fans out there. It's also worth noting that a few weeks back he grabbed some interesting aerial footage. These shots are just great and they give you a clearer idea of the layout and the magnitude of what is going on here at the site. This shot is a few weeks old now and it gives you a good idea how much larger the assembly building is compared to other structures on the site. It's actually quite a lot bigger than it appears. A huge thank you to Lab Padre for the amazing work being done here to continue providing amazing content for the community. I highly recommend subscribing to Lab Padre's channel if you want to check out the goings on at Boca Chica in real time. A link to that is also in the description. 
Now SpaceX's Starlink 5 launch has been an interesting one. We're so used to seeing SpaceX launch so routinely without incident that when things go a little wrong it seems quite out of the ordinary. We'll talk more of that in a moment but real quick this video is sponsored by Brilliant who have been huge supporters of my channel. Brilliant's mission is to help people achieve their learning goals so whether you're a student, a professional brushing up on learning cutting edge topics or someone who just wants to understand the world better you should check out Brilliant. Set a goal to improve yourself and then work at that goal a little bit every day. Brilliant makes that easy with interactive explorations and a mobile app that you can use on the go. If you're naturally curious, want to build your problem solving skills or need to develop confidence in your analytical abilities then get Brilliant Premium to learn something new every day. Brilliant's thought provoking math, science and computer science content helps guide you to mastery by taking complex concepts and breaking them into bite sized understandable chunks. You'll start by having fun with their interactive explorations and over time you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. Thank you very much to Brilliant for their support in this channel and if you would like to help support me and would like to give it a try go to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people will get 20% off for the first year of Brilliant Premium. The link is in the description below. So yes, on March 15th, SpaceX attempted the launch of the Starlink 5 mission, but just as the timer hit zero where we would usually see the Falcon 9 take to the skies, this time the rocket made the decision to abort. We all witnessed the engine plume followed by a quick halt before the engines fired up to full power. SpaceX later tweeted that this was due to out of family data. This means that the full family of nine Merlin engines did not fully power up as expected, which triggered the automated abort. A few days later though the mission did launch and this was the fifth flight of the booster. Reusability is a core of everything that SpaceX does so this was an exciting one to watch. There were some bonus snapshots of Starship development included in the introduction of the live stream as well. A bunch of bulkhead shots here but one that was particularly interesting for me were the shots of the Starship section here that surrounds the engine section at the bottom of the Starship. Nice to see such detailed shots of the welding work here. So yes, this Starlink mission was flown with the booster designated B1048 and it had already flown four other times. Sadly, that was its last flight because we didn't even hear a call out for a landing burn at all. As far as we've seen, the booster was lost somewhere between re-entry and that landing burn. Elon Musk quickly provided an official answer on this saying that there was an early engine shutdown on the ascent, but it didn't affect the orbital insertion of the payload. This demonstrates the value of having nine separate engines. Even after a failure, the mission could proceed as normal to get that payload into orbit. He also added that a thorough investigation will be needed before the next mission. So yes, this is the second loss in a row from a drone ship landing, which were both coincidentally Starlink launches. The CRS-20 mission in between of course landed back at the landing site. The fairing recovery ships Go Miss Tree and Go Miss Chief were out there to attempt another catch of both fairings. SpaceX tweeted soon after saying that after landing in the water both fairing halves were quickly recovered. So yes, sadly no catch out of the air for this mission either. Simply dragging them in from the ocean is still effective though. The only reason it's more ideal to catch them out of the air is just to limit salt water damage to the internal components of the fairings themselves. These fairings in particular had flown before on the Starlink mission from May in 2019. It's great news to see the fairing reusability making some progress there. Although it's only the second time SpaceX has reflown a full payload fairing, we certainly expect to see many more. So yes, regardless of the loss of the booster, the Starlink mission was a complete success and just before deployment it was announced that previous test paint that had been used to reduce reflectivity of the Starlink satellites has shown a notable reduction in the amount of light reflected to the ground. This whole subject of course has caused a number of those in the community to be quite upset about the proposed Starlink network claiming that it will ruin astronomy. More interesting though was the idea mentioned here in the live stream saying that a sunshade is a promising solution which would deploy to assist in this issue. That's an idea planned for a future launch. This is quite interesting. I can't wait to see how that would work. Another 60 satellites in orbit and we're getting closer and closer to a network that can be utilized. I just love watching the full stack of satellites here just drift slowly away. Incredible footage there from SpaceX as always. 
Now, if you are a fan of the incredible work Rocket Lab have been doing in the small satellite arena, you might be interested in this news here early in the week. Rocket Lab will acquire the satellite hardware manufacturer Sinclair Interplanetary, which is going to allow both companies to join forces and improve the capability to provide small satellite customers with better launch services. Sinclair Interplanetary in the past have very successfully developed components such as reaction wheels and star trackers that support the small satellite vehicles. They have, of course, also worked tight with Rocket Lab on missions before, such as the satellite by Astro Digital, which launched back in October of 2019 on the As the Crow Flies launch. This is all great news and means that Rocket Lab and Sinclair as a combined team can kick some new goals together. The details haven't been fully disclosed, but I'm excited to see progress with the production of the Photon spacecraft, which is a key reason for this acquisition. This section of the rocket is the final stage, and it's essentially an evolution of Rocket Lab's kick stage. As they say on the website, the Photon spacecraft is a high-powered iteration of the flight-proven 3D-printed Curie propulsion system, and it can support mission lengths as high as five years. So yes, it's always exciting to see news here with Rocket Lab. Even though these are small satellite launches, the technology in this arena is super important for the many customers that can't be delivered to the orbit they need on a shared mission, such as what we sometimes see with SpaceX Falcon 9 shared launches. Now, along with this, Rocket Lab has also announced that NASA has certified the Electron rocket, which provides new confidence for future low-cost small satellite missions with NASA. This has all been made possible by the previous missions such as the successful launch of NASA's ELENA-19 mission, which placed 13 CubeSats into orbit in December of 2018. Congratulations Rocket Lab for these amazing achievements. We can't wait to see some new launches very soon. Now just quickly, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. You are quite literally turning this dream of mine of creating this content from a hobby into something much bigger. If you like what I do and you would like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included exclusive roles in Discord. You can check out some exclusive patron only content and you can have your name listed right here like these other incredible people. A massive thank you of course as well to my quality control Control Squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video from last week talking about the Starship development and all sorts of other news. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.